The moderator for this session is Justine Phoenix. She is head of Diversity Projects North America for NIXA. Uh, for those who don't know what NIXA is, it is the uh, not-for-profit uh, not trade body uh, that represents the uh, global asset management industry. Justine, over to you. Thank you, Dylan, and welcome to our fireside chat, inclusivity in this digital landscape. I'm Justine Phoenix, and I'm head of NIXA's Diversity Project North America, and I'm joined by two of our Diversity Project founding members. Me, Fitzgerald, and Paul Alschwanger. Before we start our intros, let me tell you a little bit about the Diversity Project North America. It is an association representing every facet of asset management and global wealth management, working to accelerate DEI in our industry. We are focused on a diverse and inclusive asset management industry that reflects the clients that we serve. We want to ensure that we have diverse talent, so we look at best practices for recruitment and retention to have a broad range of candidates to work in our industry. We collaborate together with best practices and we look to see inefficiencies and um, deficiencies in our, our, in our asset management industry. And we work to advocate for change and work and collaborate in partnership together. So, um, so this is a great opportunity for me to turn and introduce to our two diversity project members. And I'll start with me if you, you could introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Justine. Um, so my name is Neve Fitzgerald. Um, I head our client for BMO Asset Management. I head the um, institutional client division. Um, a proud member, and as we know, a proud member of the Diversity Project. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Paul. Thank you, Justine. Um, so Paul Schwinger, I. I wear a lot of hats with Aon within our investment business, but three primary ones are I, I work very closely one on one as a performance coach with many of our uh, professionals throughout North America to help them. To survive. I also get involved with um, a, a, a company wide project where we look to bring the best of Aon to our clients. It's, it's a concerted effort to. Um, to tap into the, the different businesses and the resources that we have to offer. <clears throat> then the third uh, leg of the stool is that I'm very involved in leading a lot of our initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Paul. And uh, let's, uh, let's start a discussion, our, our fireside chat on Paul and me, you know, our, our work, our life balance have all been impacted and have changed dramatically due to the pandemic over the past seven months. And we are truly moving into a, a digital landscape. Um, and some research that uh, recently was done by the Catalyst Organization in association with Edelman Intelligence was done in uh, June of this year. And they surveyed over 1,100 people in the workforce across gender and race. And it was an interesting um, survey result that I, I noticed is that um, across gender and race, there was an optimism uh, about progress for inclusion and gender equity as a result of the workforce changes due to COVID-19, but the respondents were skeptical about their own organization. So seven out of 10 of the respondents were encouraged and felt that this was an opportunity to accelerate workforce gender equity. But when they were asked about their own organizations, only 40% felt optimistic about their firms being fully committed. So uh, and some optimism, but some skepticism. And then while workers felt they had an opportunity to control their work-life balance, 45% felt that they were more stressed about their work and their life. And the majority of those respondents were women in leadership positions. So something to consider, interesting. And uh, today we are going to discuss inclusion in the digital landscape and how to build an inclusive environment. And if there's something that we've learned over the past seven months, and if there's optimism about the ability to celebrate inclusion and equity in the workplace, what do we need to do? So, Paul, let's start with you because I know you spend a lot of time here. We need to think innovatively about how to build a culture around flexible working. How should we be driving next practices in the asset management industry? I, I think we I think we need to go beyond the traditional HR-driven programs like unconscious bias um, and, and not have that just to be a, a, a check to, to 
satisfy ourselves that we're, we're doing enough. I think colleagues need to practice whatever programs we come up with like that, but we need to practice it consistently with what we just learned. Otherwise, it's it's just a, um, a jolt of, of caffeine that wears off. Um, I think we need to offer virtual uh, diversity and, and um, inclusion training from outside and inspiring speakers, and there are plenty of those out there. Um, I think we need to make it easier for all people to find and, and participate in the employee or, or business resource groups, especially right now where people are isolated. Um, acknowledging more holidays of all cultures and, and just better understanding the unique needs and family dynamics of each colleague um, and, and structuring a more thoughtful, organized, and consistent process for reaching out to colleagues. Um, I think finding that we're through the pandemic that we're actually learning more about our colleagues beyond the, the professional landscape. Um, I think we need to provide them with the best tools. If we're gonna ask them to work virtually, which we've proven that it can be done, we need to provide them with the best tools to, to work virtually. Um, and, and then there may be more training as a result that's needed to know how to best communicate with clients virtually. Um, and in my experience coaching people, um, women tend to share their feelings more openly than men, and I think they can actually help to get men to open up that when I ask them, how are they doing with the pandemic, and they just say, fine, it's possible that they're not doing fine. And so um, it's an interesting twist to think, how can we get women to get men to open up more? Very good, very good. Uh, any, any, any comments on uh, Paul? You know, I, I, you know, I agree with Paul. I think we really need to look beyond kind of the organizational efforts and see really how um, inclusivity is being fully integrated. I think the companies that can really take uh, the steps to under, to adapt and uh, based on understanding rather than assumptions um, as we think about how we transform our businesses from how we work to where we work, um, I think it's really going to be that kind of employee up um, voice that is going to make the real impact and companies that can really capitalize on the voice of their employees will be the ones who are really driving the next practice and can retain their staff and can retain their um, culture, their employees, etc. And so for me, it really is about activating your ESG, or your ERGs, engaging uh, in listening groups and working groups right across your organization. I don't think it takes to be, you know, BMO's a big organization, Aon's a big organization. I just don't think it needs to be a large organization that does this. I think it's adaptable to any type and size of organizations, but it has to go beyond just your unconscious bias training and has to get down to uh, the listening sessions and hearing what inclusivity and what works from home and what balance um, kind of the employees are looking for. So in the in this virtual world, and I'll, I'll stick with Nidhi for this this question. Um, what does leadership look like? What it, what is it to be a leader in a virtual world? Yeah, I mean, look, I was definitely as I kind of came into this, um, it, it was a lot of new learning for I think for me and for our organization and for everyone who's being a leader. And what's been really nice, that, and you touch upon it, is um, you know technology and everything like that has been pushing organizations forward. We've been adapting really quickly to that. But coupled with that has been this really um, interesting push on the softer skills to leadership. Um, Paul touched on it a little bit in, the, in his last comments, um, that really hasn't been traditionally, in, not necessarily encouraged, but the traditional way of leading within the asset management industry. So that kind of human-centered approach to leadership, things like leading with humility, leading with empathy, asking the right questions, um, and partnering with your teams to understand how they can be effective. Um, has really kind of come to the forefront. And I think those are the types of managers um, that are really going to help companies emerge out of this crisis and find a balance um, in this type of hybrid work from home, return to office or full work from home um, working style. And so I really do think it's going to be that um, 
a great opportunity for new people to step forward or the organizations to look into um, members of their teams and members of their um, universe that have, they haven't necessarily thought of before because they demonstrate an abundance of these programs. And I do think, um, you know, gender is a huge part of that. And I do think kind of as Paul alluded to, women can step up into much more senior leadership roles because they do take um, on a huge responsibility for that type of softer skills coupled with crisis management and just a drive for data and technology. So in a virtual world, the softer skills become even more and more thing is that, 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 that ability to sort of reach out and, and, and understand when an employee is, is having an issue. It's, we're not in person anymore, but, but you know, we're starting to read each other on the screens in some ways and, and reaching out. So Paul, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, to kind of go along with, with Mee's comments, she said that um, we need to ask questions and uh, based on improving questions and, and find out how our employees doing. I mentioned that um, people are feeling stressed. I mean, it, it's, it, there's a lot of different things going on here uh, with our work-life balance and just our environmental and social issues that we're, all of us are dealing with. What are the types of questions we should be asking our, our employees and our associates uh, in, this, in this new environment? I, I think there's a lot of questions to ask, right? And even going back to the question you asked, Dave, is, is um, it's got to start with a high level of sincerity and compassion and empathy where you're not just going through the motions and checking the box that you ask the question. You've got to demonstrate as a leader that you have that high level of compassion for people. And so that when you are asking them questions like, how are you doing? How is your family doing? How can I help you? Uh, what, are your, what are your biggest challenges that you're facing right now during COVID? Uh, what are you sharing with your children, if you have children, about what's going on in the world uh, beyond the pandemic? Um, and, and what are you doing to stay fresh, focused, and healthy versus um, many people now are finding themselves sitting in a chair more often throughout the day on conference calls, and they're just back to back to back, and, um, and that's a challenge uh, for people to stay fresh and focused and healthy. So I, I really stress the importance of, of being super compassionate, sincere, authentic, and, and being organized as well. Um, so when you have big organizations like Neve and I have, um, it, it does take some, um, some planning to say, are we thinking about our people? And are we thinking about them in the right way? And are we getting personal with them so that we know the difference between one colleague and another in terms of what they're dealing with and how we can help them? Leave any, any comments? I'll, I'll throw our next question to you, but any comments on, on uh, probing questions or how we stay connected? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think we could all think of a hundred questions to add. I think Paul, you know, hit on them really nicely. I guess the only thing that I would emphasize is the, you know, Paul's comment on leading by example, right? So we have to give the managers the flexibility to to actually embody some of those things and to be a little bit vulnerable and answer those questions. Because, you know, it was quite interesting we had a conversation in one of our listening groups as we start thinking about Workplace 2.0. And one of our uh, managers said, I feel like I should lead by example, be, you know, think about being one of the first back to the office. And then somebody else said, but don't you think that would put pressure on the rest of your teams to therefore do that, um, where they might want to work from home? And so I think we need to really go underneath the surface and talk a little bit about what actually is that model? What is the work from home model? And make sure at all layers of the organization, we're embracing it and we're um, leading by example for it. So that those types of questions and people feel comfortable not only answering those questions, we create that environment, but we also create that environment that is going to be longer term acceptable. We don't slip back into that if you're seen, therefore you are doing the work. So can I I'll just so we talked a little bit about leadership skills and that's at an, an individual level, right? So we 
the, um, so we all work for organizations. We both work for large organizations. Take it, if you want to take it up a, a click on, on the organization side, um, and I'll start with you, Edie. What do organizations need to do to be supportive on in, an, in a virtual world in a digital environment? Um, and again, the mental and, and um, you know, um, health well-being, as, as Paul said, make sure you're staying healthy. What can organizations do? Think about, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, you know, I'd re-emphasize the point I made it kind of about earlier on, and, and that's listening, right? Um, you know, we talk a little bit, we've talked a little bit about the pandemic, but also economic challenges, we work in the financial industry, but also the racial and social challenges as well. And so organizations that just assume that they know the best path forward has probably pivoted about four times um, as, as we've gone through the 2020. It's been an incredible year. And so from my perspective, it's really just about listening, creating those working groups and, and creating those um, kind of listening sessions with your employees and being adaptable, right? I think we, you know, when we come into a crisis, everybody is moving at 100 miles an hour, companies, leaders, employees, and so being adaptable as well to the mental health of your employees, so having the flexibility around work time, having the flexibility around caregivers, having the emotional flexibility for people who are dealing with this pandemic and these multiple um, challenges in different ways. And so the asset management industry and financial industry has been somewhat of a kind of more traditional and rigid industry in the past. And I think everything that 2020 is teaching us is that push towards flexibility and that the push towards kind of the uh, employee being at the center of really how we think in order to drive productivity, drive a great culture, um, and to drive results. Yeah. Paul, your thoughts on that, on, on organizational um yeah, you know, the impact uh, from from an organizational perspective on how, how you know, I think Neil has some great comments about um, looking at it, you know how we can pivot quickly. I mean, many of us, many of our organizations had to pivot in, in, in days and shift our workforce, but now we've got a, a, an opportunity to really look at how we support. What, what are your thoughts, Paul? Yeah, no, I I think that uh, number one, you want to be really careful when you talk about uh, some of the positives that we've learned. Uh, about our our ability to adapt uh, and respond, and, and kind of our uh, what we refer to our CEO Greg Case says is the new better. We've been talking about a new normal for a while, but the mindset of new better, and, and part of that new better can be, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, Aon had a team of multiple people uh, do a virtual uh, presentation uh, yesterday, and um, no one had to travel. Uh, no one had to sleep in, you know, a hotel room or get on a plane or, and um, the presentation went very smooth and a lot of people felt really good about their role and the fact that we could pull this off and use the technology. I only mention that because it's a great example of how we can respond and adapt to a, a really changing environment. And the other part of it is the people on the other end may not have the access to all the technology that we have, but they are realizing that this can be done. We don't have to do as much in person as we used to, although many of us still miss that. And there are still some aspects that uh, over time we'd like to get back to. But um, I do think we're learning over time that we can, we can do more and we can do it more efficiently. Well, let's um, talk a little bit about um, Lessons learned, and um, I'll start with, uh, with with you, Paul. I'm sorry, two questions earlier, but um, so if we look back at um, you know the experience that we've had, and you look at kind of the, the road, the path that we're on, on um, if you and I'll ask both of you to do this, would you uh, sort of reflect on what you've learned, and also on how how this helps us to be more inclusive and uh, from a you know, a wide perspective, wide, right, in terms of inclusivity, but um, maybe maybe a little comments there, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask you first, and, you know, I want to hear from you as well, but, uh, you know, lessons learned, and then how how, how can we continue and accelerate our, our diversity and look at the new environment? Yeah, yeah, I thought, you know, a really good question. That's a fair question. You know, I, I go back to a lot of the conversations that I have one-on-one -on -one with our colleagues, and I've noticed that 
uh, the longer we're into the pandemic, there's a tendency to look in the rearview mirror and say, wow, this is this has been going on for several months. And um, and then they start to worry about how long this is going to go on and, and what that means and how difficult it's going to be and and um, how isolated they, they might feel. And and so the challenge is to get their mindset to be more in the present. And and that is so to stop looking in the rearview mirror. There's nothing we can do about what's happened in the past, and there's probably not a lot we have to control in the future, whether it's a vaccine or or whatever it might be. I mean, yes, you can take the best care of yourself and be be safe and wear a mask and, and social distance. But I think to just have the right balance in terms of looking back and looking forward. To me, I'm always thinking of people's mindset. Where is it? Um, what are they worried about? What's keeping them from being their best uh, professionally and personally? And I think to get people to embrace this this uh, this new better and and really buy into that, to utilize the technology that we know we we have access to, how we communicate internally as well as externally, and then we've got to take it upon ourselves to be proactive in connecting with people. So we can't sit back and say, "Oh, I'm isolated." I don't feel connected. I think we all have to take it upon ourselves to be very proactive, whether it's friends, colleagues, clients. Uh, those are just some of the things that came to mind what we've learned. So I think, um, you know, some of us are getting a little um, zoomed out. Right? So, so um, you know, from, like you mentioned, we're sitting in front of the screens all day. Paul, what's a, what's a good way to connect? What do you, what's really the best practice on how to connect? With our, our colleagues outside of these, the group meetings that we have, or, but what, what, do you, what would you recommend? Uh, you know, if, if they're if they're zoomed out, I get that. Um, you know, if, if they're in the same room and they're comfortable being outside and distant and wearing masks, that that's that's another. There aren't a lot of options, honestly, yeah. as far as um, you, you know. There's there's only so many things you can do to to stay connected. Uh, as long as you're not text messaging and and um, you know the the old fashioned calling someone up and talking to them. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I I don't know. That's a great question as far as what else we could do to stay connected other than the uh, the typical ways to do it. Um, I, yeah. I do think that uh, showing yourself virtually on calls. I understand it's it's getting uh, it, it's getting old for a lot of people. Maybe they don't feel like you know, their hair looks right that day or they don't like the background, um, but it is still better than just a simple phone call uh, yeah. or, or email. So, um, you know, what I would tell people is hang in there with the, the Zoom calls, uh, it is better and it still shows a connection even though you're not together in person. All right, so Neva, I'll turn to you then on and, and uh, kind of the same question I asked Paul is, is that what, what have we learned? What are our lessons that we've learned over these past few months? And then um, going forward, how do we make sure that in a virtual environment, it is a it is diverse, it is an inclusive, inclusive environment? Uh, what's what's the next step? So we'll look back and we'll look forward. So, you know, I think I'll, I'll jump on to, to, to Paul's point there where he was saying, you know, stick with Zoom I'm a little bit different. I think we need to mix it up a little bit. And we've all kind of felt like, you know, those 30 minute meetings, 30 minute meetings, and you're constantly jumping from Zoom to Zoom or Teams to Teams. Um, and so we say mix it up. So, um, you know, something that our CEO encourages us all to do is take walking meetings, right? And by that is pick up the phone and just go for a walk, walk around your house, and don't just sit there during the meetings. Like think of ways that you can just mix up your own day because that can, one, just help from a de-stressing perspective, but also help with the flow and the thought process of conversations. Um, and another thing, you know, to keep connectivity is we found that we are we were working so well and so strong within our own teams, but innovation and across team kind of collisions um, have somewhat um, have somewhat struggled, and so we're looking for teams and managers to come up with cross-functional projects that can inspire innovation, can 
pull people just ne not necessarily just in their day-to-day -day of their job, but thinking about different things that can push the business forward. So the more we're doing those types of things, the more the less it feels like just another Zoom call and maybe gives people a bit of an opportunity to diversify in the day-to-day -day work that they're doing and the thought that they're bringing and give more people the opportunity to kind of speak up and be involved. So, you know, I think that's just, a, you know, a couple of things that we've been trying to do to, to just get past a little bit of work from home home fatigue because you know this is something that we're going to be doing kind of longer term mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I mean, you, know, you 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 mentioned kind of looking beyond that as well and so some of the things that we're just trying to do as an organization it, it, it's pivot a little bit from maybe kind of the policies etc that we have in place and moving towards more guidance um, and so instead of saying you know you must do this or this is how to do that we're creating that flexibility around giving managers the opportunity to guide people um, along their path and pivot that to the individual and us not necessarily you know, just about policies and need to put in place on, on a go forward basis yeah, yeah absolutely so um, we have a couple minutes left, and um, you both are very active in the Diversity Project North America, as I, I, I said in our introductory comments. And so we talked a little bit about leadership in our own organizations, about our own organizations, but um, maybe just a couple of things about um, cross-collaborating within the industry and how we can help each other um and the benefits that we have as we look across uh, our industry and across uh, from a diversity and inclusion perspective so paul any comments about you know how how we can all lift each other up and rise up yeah i mean uh look every day i want to feel like i've been a part of the the solution and not the problem and i i really focus on action and uh through my involvement with the diversity project I have been able to hear what other organizations are doing, but not in a competitive way. We are all trying to help each other. We're all trying to share. And I've brought several ideas back to our, our firm. Um, and, and I think that's what it's about is we're all striving as, as, a, as a society and as an as a industry to do better, to be more diverse, to, to be more inclusive. And um, it, it is a bit like a big puzzle that's complicated. And we've, figured, we've found most of the pieces, but we can't find all the pieces. And so this is going to be an ongoing challenge. And so to have uh, great people that are committed to this, no matter how hard it is, no matter how, how uh, tough it is to break through some of these barriers, we're all kind of in this together. And, and uh, even something simple, like talking about a speaker that someone had recently and sharing that. Thank you, Eve. Um, those, those are the little things that are really <laughs> super powerful that, that we can learn from each other. Yeah, that's very Paul. Thank you. And Eve, any comments for you on, on industry collaboration? Yeah, I mean, look, it's been a fantastic benefit and privilege to be part of the diversity project and to be a founding member. Um, for us at BIM, I mean, Paul mentioned it, we've been on the calls, you know, kind of like all in the background of the diversity project and um, trying to learn from each other. Have you tried this? How, what, have, what were the successes? Where have you pivoted from it? And it really has been a really a nice opportunity to just float ideas and float challenges that we've been had in a very collaborative um, structure and um, with you know companies who are much larger than ours, smaller than ours, and really kind of understanding and um, the challenges that they're facing and come facing and coming up with their best ideas. It's, um, you know, when it, whether it's the listen and lead and learn sessions or whether it's been the simple stars, we've been able to really take some nice tips and tricks um, and bring them back into our organization. So it, it really has been a fantastic um, benefit for, for us and for our organization. And I'd say the second thing is, is we have a whole host of volunteers um, right across um, GAM, GAM in the UK um, and here in the US. And so it's been a really great way of kind of showing the importance of inclusivity, diversity, and equity right across the different um, teams and um, our, uh, right across our, colle um, our colleagues globally as well. So we've really enjoyed that um, and it's aided our discussions internally. So Paul and me, thank you very much for your leadership and uh, for our conversation today. 
And um, thank you all for listening in. We appreciate it. We were very pleased to be here today. And uh, now we'll turn it over and open up for questions. Thank you. Thanks again. And uh, let's uh, we've got some um, start to some questions that we have from our audience. We have uh, some uh, really good questions. So thank you for uh, for engaging with us. And uh, the first question is actually a topic we really didn't cover uh, today, but um, it's one I think we've all dealt with. It is do you think surveys are an effective way to gather sentiment? And uh, some complain of survey fatigue. So it's a, sort of a two part question here. Um, do you think surveys are an effective way to gather sentiment, or is there another way? So um, I think I'll turn first to, to me to uh, let me, uh, let, let's hear what you think. Yeah, so I think we can all understand survey fatigue, and um, I think we've all felt that at some point in time. Um, however, surveys are an effective way at getting a pulse check or a sentiment um, of you know teams, employees, especially at different um, vantage points and at different, especially phases potentially of this um, of these crises or this pandemic. And um, so, in a, just an example of what we did is you know we do an annual survey pulse check. Um, internally. Um, this year we have decided to up the number of those without going over the top. And I think that's a huge balance that we need everybody needs to be aware of. We did one pandemic and then we pushed one out again to the summertime. And we've really been looking to compare and contrast those different results. And um, they are playing in extremely, they are being very impactful into how we think about workplace 2.0 and how we move forward um, into a hybrid work um, from home environment for us and um, to, to look at alternatives or different ways I mean really we all we coupled our surveys with listening groups and we kind of took a, a diverse cross-section of um, our asset management firm globally regionally and we did listening sessions on various different topics and they have been phenomenal one it's a safe environment we created a safe environment and we did our best to create a safe environment for people to share and um, but also then we took those feedbacks we were able to ask questions provide follow-up and then really show tangible change from those listening sessions. So we found that the combination of not just a blank, you know, Q&A um, with also some good open dialogue has been really helpful for us. Sort of a combination of, of survey, dialogue, and kind of perhaps, you know, kind of combat that, that survey fatigue. So yes. great. So thank you. So we have another question on about workplace flexibility. Is it here to stay? So are we going to continue to kind of look at um, flexibility in our ability to work from home or our work where we or live where we work? And um, are you hearing about any new policies uh, being uh, solidified at the corporate level? So Paula, I'll turn it to you for the first part of that question. Right, I get the easy part. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes, the answer is yes. I think flexibility is here to stay. I think we've proven uh, that that uh, we we have the technology, uh, we have the the resources, uh, the, and we've got the uh, we've got the human capital that's proven, uh, you know, across the board that we can adapt to uh, to change to challenges like this, and um, and so I think in some way or another, yes, uh, it is here to stay. The flexibility is here. It doesn't mean that we aren't going to eventually get back to a, a more uh, normal environment where we do physically go into an office or we get on an airplane. But I think what's also is important to know is that our clients have also adapted. And so you've got both sides figuring out kind of a, a you know an alternative way to communicate. And so I do think it's here to stay. Any corporate policies? Any, any, have you either of you ever heard of it too early yet? Yeah, I think what we've really been talking here at BMO is, is this to avoid the slippery slope, right? And so as we start thinking about certain people being um, returning to the office or creating a hybrid structure and creating that flexibility, that if we see managers returning back or if you see kind of senior leaders returning back and then others start following on to that um, kind of, I must return in order to do well and to be promoted and that just that's a slippery slope to do. And so what we're really trying to do from a policies and practice perspective is, to, is, is really have an open dialogue about how our performance structures and how uh, production and product is, you know, going to be truly, truly um, 
uh, rewarded. And so I think corporations and companies need to be very, very um, clear with what is best practice with us, that flexible work environment. And we need to see people actually living that from a day to day basis. And I think that's the type of conversation that needs to start happening now before people start um, thinking about the return to work. Thank you. So let me, I think I have a, like a, just a quick minute left and I thought I'd ask on um, Paul, maybe you can talk a little bit about, we talked earlier about finding your voice and employee, the importance of employees having a voice and, you know, feeling that they're in a comfortable environment. Um, just, just real quick, um, how do we do that? How do we make sure people feel that it's safe and it's, that they are truly in an inclusive environment? Well, for Dave and I, we're both part of large you know, global organizations and for Aon, we have multiple businesses that, that uh, we are, um, you know, heavily involved with. And, and so I think the key is how do you make um, a business so big and global and complex? How do you make it smaller for people to have that voice, to have that opportunity? And so we do have a number of, we call them business resource group, others call them employee resource groups. But um, they cover the gamut of, of uh, whether it's a focus on women, people of color, sexual orientation, what have you. And we really, really support uh, whether it's starting in a new location um, or just the concept of the group itself. So that's that's one way. Um, we also think um, just the the idea of, of when you're um, trying to make people feel a part of something anyway, but also during the pandemic is uh, we've got to give people an opportunity to have that voice. And so the key is, you know, are, are listening to them and, and are they feeling like their voice is important? And sometimes it means giving them more tasks to do so that they're involved with conversations that maybe they weren't in the past. So those are just a few things that come to mind. Thank you, Paul. And again, thank you to our audience here for your questions.